Coming up tonight on YCN News, a homeless man is found dead on the tracks near the Amtrak station in White River Junction, Vermont. A patient is diagnosed with the nation's first confirmed case of Ebola. And today is the first day of Vermont's ban on handheld electronic devices while driving. For more news, weather, and sports, it's time for YCN, your local view. Now, your daily digest of the Dartmouth Lake Sunapee region, southern Vermont, and Windsor County. News, sports, weather, and all that is happening in our area. The news on YCN, your local view. Good evening, and welcome to this Wednesday edition of YCN News. I'm Rose Spillman. A homeless man has been found dead on train tracks near the Amtrak station in White River Junction, Vermont, police report today. The body of 52-year-old Scott Smith was found on the tracks early today. Smith turned 52 on September 6th. It was 12.20 a.m. when Hartford police received a call that a body was lying on the railroad tracks about 100 yards south of the train station. The tracks run parallel to South Main Street in White River Junction. Smith's body was discovered by the operator of a slow-moving northbound train owned and operated by New England Central Railroad. Police say evidence found at the scene suggests that it was another train, unidentified at this time, that came into contact with Smith and did not realize it at that time. The investigation continues into the timeline and train involved. Smith, say police, earlier was warned about trespassing on railroad property. Police say Smith was verbally told to stay off train tracks and land on last Thursday. Two days later, on Saturday, September 27th, police issued Smith a criminal citation for unlawful trespass because he was again on property belonging to the railroad. The Hartford Police Department requests that anyone who may have had contact with Smith in the day and night before he died to contact Sergeant Carl Ebighausen at 802-295-9425. Also in the Upper Valley today, layoffs at the Geisel School of Medicine in Hanover are being announced, reducing the number of employees at the school affiliated with Dartmouth College. The Valley News reports the layoffs may come from a number of departments. Details about where the cuts will come from remain unknown. When Interim Medical School Dean Dwayne Compton took office in June, the school was $5.5 million in the red. The school, the newspaper reports, had a $275 million operating budget in its fiscal year 2013. The school runs on a July 1st to June 30th operating calendar. That's when school leaders realized they would need to reduce spending by about $10 million to run again in the black. Earlier this year, Geisel welcomed 89 new medical school students into its class of 2018. In all, the student body comprises 360 medical school students and another 340 scholars seeking advanced degrees. Meanwhile, in other medical news, it may have been a case of don't ask, don't tell regarding the first reported case of the Ebola virus in the United States. CNN reports the man did not tell people at the first hospital he went to in Dallas that he had been in Liberia, Africa. Apparently, healthcare providers at the hospital did not ask him if he had recently traveled to or from the U.S. Dr. Thomas Frieden, medical leader of the Centers for Disease Control, says the patient diagnosed with the nation's first confirmed case of Ebola continues to remain in isolation. Calls to the Vermont and New Hampshire Departments of Health requesting more information on the Ebola virus were not returned by broadcast time. The virus, which has no known cure yet, spreads from direct physical contact with body fluids or blood. This means any kind of fluid that comes from the body. A person must be infected with the virus to be able to spread it to another person. For more information, go online to cdc.gov. Meanwhile, there is positive news to report on the flu. Potential tests to help doctors diagnose influenza sooner and more accurately are underway. Officials with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services report the tests could help boost influenza pandemic preparedness by making flu diagnoses quicker and easier for clinicians. 
Check your local hospitals and healthcare centers for free flu shot clinics. Today is an important day for all Vermonters and anyone traveling through the state as it is the first official day that the state will ban handheld use of electronics while driving. This ban includes any devices such as laptops, music players and of course cell phones. The Vermont Highway Safety Alliance states that use of electronics is acceptable when using a setting such as Bluetooth or keeping devices in a cradle mounted in the vehicle so the driver does not need either hand to use the electronic. The law also does not prohibit handheld use when the driver needs to contact law enforcement or emergency service in an emergency situation. A driver caught using a handheld device on the first violation will be fined between $100 and $200 with no points issued to the license. A second time offense within two years will lead to a fine between $250 to $500 with no points given. In a work zone, the first violation will assess two points against the driver's record, and upon a second violation within a work zone, five points will be assessed. New Hampshire has also approved a ban similar to Vermont's, which will prohibit handheld use of electronics while driving. This ban will take effect next year in July of 2015. First-time offenders will be fined $100, second-time offenders $250, and any subsequent offenders within the first two years of being charged will be fined $500. The New Hampshire law will also allow for hands-free use, such as Bluetooth and handheld use, for emergency service calls. The use of non-cellular two-way radios will be allowed as well. When YCN News returns, we'll learn about a benefit for the Putney Food Shelf and a horse in Meriden, New Hampshire in need of a new home. The YCN News continues in a moment. Welcome back to YCN News. I'm Rose Spillman. People Helping People was the focus yesterday in Putney, Vermont. Volunteers gave of their time and participants emptied their pantries to help other people in need of food. Let's learn more about yesterday's work to benefit the Putney Food Shelf. Hi, I'm Susan Kaczynskis. I'm with the Putney Food Shelf here in Putney, Vermont at Next Stage on Kimball Hill. We're here today filling Next Stage with groceries to restock the Putney food shelf. This is our first annual Fill the Next Stage. We're, we're uh, really pleased at how successful it's been today, and I bet you'll be seeing us trying to fill the Next Stage again and again. So we've had a team of food shelf volunteers as well as students from area schools on hand where we've had curbside attendance. So any cars, because there's not a lot of parking on Main Street here, um, cars pull up, we meet them at the car, we get their bags, we thank them, we hand them a magnet as a thank you, and then the bags come into the next stage where they get weighed and get marked and brought up and put on one of the seats. Part of the Putney Food Shelf mission, which is supplying you know, supplemental healthy food, so we asked for healthy food, and then your typical tuna fish, peanut butter, spaghetti sauce, pasta, canned vegetables, tinned meat, you name it. But we've kind of kept it, you know, try and keep it healthy. And if you wouldn't eat it, don't donate it. So we've seen this year more and more people coming to the food shelf. And it's not just people who are out of work. It's also we're seeing a lot more people who are, are working poor. Um, minimum wage today just doesn't cut it if you have a family. So people are coming to the food shelf and needing help with some extra food. So all day from 7 a.m. till 7 p.m. we have had the Putney Food Shelf do a fill the next stage event, filling it with, as you can see, bags of groceries. And this is to build awareness about hunger in Putney and to restock the food shelf with food. The Putney Food Shelf, as do other food pantries, help families and especially children. Please consider making donations of non-perishable food items at your local food pantry. It's never easy to say goodbye to a friend, including animal friends. Meriden, New Hampshire resident Kathy Laflamme is giving away her 12-year-old Arabian horse named Shatir. The horse is in good health and is fully vaccinated. Shatir is boarding at a stable in Cornish. Laflamme seeks a good home for Shatir, who won blue ribbons while under Laflamme's care. 
Laflamme would like to find an experienced horse rider for Shatir. She regrets that she doesn't have the time to devote to Shatir's care. Shatir likes to be groomed, and when she is ridden, likes to go fast. So an experienced rider is needed. Laflamme, who is 52, has three other horses to care for. Shatir needs more time and energy than Laflamme can give her now. Call or email for details 603-469-3533 or kathylaflamme at gmail.com. Turning to other police news, about $195,000 worth of marijuana has been seized by Vermont State Police in September in Bennington County, Vermont, a report issued today notes. State police, local police, and police canines have worked together in their searches. Police say about 195 marijuana plants have been eradicated. A 28-year-old Bethel, Vermont man is charged by state police with aggravated domestic assault. Police arrested Marius Schweizer yesterday around 7.24 p.m. Police were called to the home for a report of a domestic disturbance. Schweizer allegedly threatened other people inside a home on McIntosh Hill Road with a knife. He left after bandaging the knife. Police found him in Randolph. He was held in Springfield, Vermont for lack of $1,000 bail. Schweizer was scheduled to appear in Windsor Court today. When YCN News returns, we'll join Kearsarge Chronicles' Lynn Solomon, who met with Michael Gelsius from Elkins Fish and Game Club. The YCN News continues in a moment. Welcome back to YCN News. I'm Rose Spillman. Now Matt McDonald will have a look at our weather for the next few days and then move on to sports. Thanks, Rose. Tonight we'll have cloudy skies with lows in the 50s and winds around 5 miles per hour. Tomorrow will be mostly cloudy with a high of 67 degrees. Tomorrow night will be partly cloudy with lows in the upper 40s. Friday will be sunny with winds around 5 miles per hour and highs in the 60s. And now it's time for our fall foliage report. We will keep you updated on the turning of the foliage in New Hampshire and Vermont counties. Now let's see what's coming up on our community calendar. Tomorrow in New Hampshire, the Claremont Farmers and Arts Market will begin at 4 p.m. In Walpole, the Select Board will meet at 6 p.m. In Vermont, the Ottaquiche River Forum will be held at the Billings Farm and Museum in Woodstock at 6.30 p.m. Remember, you can submit local events from your community by sending them to news at ycnnow.com. And now let's turn to local high school sports. There was an exciting Newport versus Sunapee girls soccer game last night. After some great plays by both teams, Sunapee was victorious, shutting out Newport 3-0. The Sunapee Lakers record now stands at 8 wins and 1 loss. Sunapee will host Pittsfield this weekend in a Saturday game. Aside from the high school sports roundup, we have a special story tonight. The 5K Run for Kehoe event is taking place this year in honor of Ed Kehoe, who passed away after a battle with cancer. Kehoe was a longtime basketball coach in the Upper Valley. The run will benefit Kehoe's children and their educational endeavors. The event is for walkers and runners, and admission is $20 per person. The event will begin at Mascoma High School at 10 a.m. for walkers and 10.30 a.m. for runners. Thanks, Matt. When YCN News continues, we'll join Capital Connections' John O'Connor, who met with Steve Smith, representative of the New Hampshire House. The YCN News continues in a moment. 